Thank everyone for joining. Um, planning on doing a little webinar series here to educate, if you will, um, on what is the merge. Um, you're probably starting to hear in, um, in, in media outlets of all types about this impending event uh, in the Ethereum network. Uh, we uh, on the phone here are the team running the DeFi on-chain hedge fund. Uh, investing in and, and, and um, allocating on-chain across all of these layer ones and layer twos and, and, and those ecosystems. Um, as many of you know who are investors of ours, we have been talking uh, for months now about flight to quality, about duress in the markets, the driving uh, activity on the Ethereum network, about developer support of the Ethereum network, about uh, application development on the Ethereum network, and, uh, you know, we love to quote uh, Warren Buffett, who says, when the tide goes out, you see who has their shorts on. Uh, there were a lot of competitors to Ethereum that rose over the last 12 to 24 months um, that all had different attributes that they thought may um, allow them or, or, uh, or allow them to compete with the um, Ethereum uh, network, be it Solana or um, uh, Avalanche, many of which we're supportive of. Um, and what's happened now is Ethereum's about to go through this merge, which is actually incorporating, ironically, a lot of the attributes that the competitors to Ethereum profess to have. And the reason why some of those competitors to Ethereum generated market share, uh, generated wallets, and, and generated development support is because they solved issues that this merge begins the solve for of the Ethereum network. So we're gonna spend some time explaining to you what that means. Um, I, I kind of chuckle when I say explaining to, because we're all uh, new in this industry and this is such a young thing, but you know we live and breathe it 24 seven and, and have spent a lot of time ensuring that we understand it and understand what that means for the holdings we have in, in our fund. Um, so we're gonna talk about the merge. We're gonna talk about the surge, the verge, the purge and the splurge. And those are all uh, you know names you would assume being indie bands on your on your iTunes, but um, somehow Vitalik has come up with these brilliant explanations for how the Ethereum network is going to mature. The most important of which is this merge. So what's going to happen here shortly is we're going to have an old piece of code, um, uh, not an old piece of code, a current piece of code merge with a new piece of code that is going to pivot the uh, Ethereum mechanism from to go from a proof of work mechanism to a proof of stake mechanism. Uh, you may have heard over the past several years critique of proof of stake. Um, there has been concern that proof of stake, if utilized on thinly traded networks, could lead to attacks. Proof of stake allows you, if you hold a, a large wallet and a large reserve, to uh, vote, in essence, all of those shares to oversimplify it. Um, and it gives those with more computing power more influence. I give a lot of credit to Vitalik and the Ethereum development community for having this be on their roadmap, but having it be at a moment in time where Ethereum has surpassed kind of critical mass. And the only people that could truly uh, incorporate, who could truly activate a, um, uh, an attack through a proof of stake mechanism would have to be a state actor. It would have to be a government. It would. It could not be, you know, um, uh, anyone that uh, is traditionally operating in these markets. There will always be theses that those people are playing and those people are moving things. Those people are driving traffic, you know, in, in our in our markets. But um, Ethereum is now past that tipping point where that is a stress. And so now we believe that the proof of uh, stake mechanism will bring efficiencies to what traditionally required a proof of work, what traditionally empowered miners to uh, do computations and to validate transactions and blocks to the Ethereum blockchain. And so we're beyond comfortable with this being not no longer a security risk for the Ethereum network. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, uh, EIP 1559, which is probably more complicated than uh, we need to get into, but it's an important dynamic where previously, block rewards for having mined or for having validated a transaction would go to that miner. And as we mature through this merge, the pivot goes to actually a burn mechanism. So Ethereum is going from an increasing supply asset 
to a fixed supply asset to a decreasing supply asset in the next 45 days. Think about what's going to happen when the 21 millionth Bitcoin is mined. Think about how crazy the world is going to go when the total supply of Bitcoin is no longer increasing. I talk a lot on a macro level about how hard it is to predict price activity when you have fluctuating supply and fluctuating demand. When you fix supply, if you believe that there will be demand more tomorrow than there is today in a fixed supply asset, regardless of what's going on in the network, that's a very important economic principle to track. If you believe total supply is decreasing and total demand is increasing, that's an even crazier dynamic that needs to be tracked. That's happening on the Ethereum network in the, last, in the next 45 days. So in the last week, we've seen almost 70% appreciation in the price of ETH. We predict that that should continue through the merge. This is the biggest macro event that will be occurring in the crypto markets for the next many years. And by a long shot, this is the biggest movement that we will see to impact the way Ethereum is engaged with and interacted with. Uh, I'm going to kick it to our lead analyst, Kyle, who, as always, has spectacular insights uh, in, into all of these core chains and, and the applications on there. And I, I want to thank Kyle for the extra work that he and Liam have done preparing this presentation um, to kind of educate us all on the depths of it. We will continue to do our best to keep it high level uh, and happy to take questions at the end. But um, I'll kick it over to Kyle to, to really go down the rabbit hole. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Will. Appreciate the kind introduction. So we will jump in to the agenda for today. <clears throat> We're going to be discussing uh, briefly the Ethereum overall development roadmap. We're going to be discussing, you know, generally speaking, what is the merge? What does it look like? When can we expect it to happen? We're going to be talking about some of the misconceptions around the merge um, and uh, how the next, again, 30 to 45 days could look. What's coming next for Ethereum? touching on sharding uh, more directly and more specifically, and then ending with uh, a discussion around ultrasound money and EIP 1559, as Will had discussed or mentioned. Sorry. So we'll go right into the Ethereum development roadmap. So Ethereum has one of the most ambitious roadmaps of any decentralized project that we see in the space. It's fascinating that these items are being worked on simultaneously by developers literally all over the world. Um, Ethereum, again, being a completely decentralized process, uh, project, excuse me, um, all of these items are being tackled by a team that's working on it collectively and something that we're following extremely closely, talking to these developers, trying to get insights on timelines and, and the progress as it develops. So we're gonna be talking specifically today about the merge and we're gonna be talking about the surge. But just so we know, these are two steps in a five-step process where we have the merge, which again, as Will said, is the transition from proof of stake to proof of work. We have the surge, which is really massive scalability uh, through sharding, um, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in detail, um, and the application of some of the layer twos that have really gotten speed recently, whether it be Arbitrum or Optimism. We'll just kind of set up this, the, the stage for the verge which is uh, the implementation of vertical trees. And again, adding additional scalability to the network in the future. We'll talk about the purge. And then finally, the splurge, which is the uh, important extras that will be added onto the network. So what's already been done? What's already been completed? We saw the implementation of the beacon chain around uh, August of last year. And we'll talk a little bit more specifically about the, the beacon chain and some of the, uh, the other items that uh, have been uh, already implemented in the consensus layer and the execution layer. So let's just jump on to the next slide. What is the merge? The merge can be summarized as the transition, as we've said, from proof of work consensus mechanism to a proof of stake consensus blockchain. We'll break down those definitions here shortly, but on this image, you can see some of the work that's being done, excuse me, uh, specifically by developers. Um, if you see on the left, we can see something that's already complete. 
when Vitalik did his presentation in Paris, he went over each one of these items, where they stand, and also noted that all of these items, interestingly enough, are being worked on simultaneously, again, by developers all over the world. So full merge specifications, something that's been complete. Um, the specifications for the merge are clearly defined. Um, it's code that's been implemented into the test networks. Uh, for example, we have the Ropstein test network that went live on June 7th, but it's all the specifications for the actual transition that's going to take place once we transition from the proof of work chain to the proof of stake chain. Um, something like fork improvements that you could see here above. This is the function that nodes use to determine which block is the head block when validating transactions on the network. And again, something that's getting very close to being complete and will have us transitioning uh, into the merge once the merge is ready, again, which is speculated to be uh, mid to late September. So as we're discussing, again, the merge in uh, broad terms, we keep coming along these uh, terminology or these, these terms, proof of work versus proof of stake. So I think it's important to define them. When we look at proof of work, uh, proof of work is something that I think a lot of the people on this call are probably familiar with. Um, the first proof of work network was really defined by the Bitcoin network. Um, proof of work is typically when the block reward is provided to the miner of that network and the miner is lending significant amount of compute power to that network and solving a cryptographic puzzle um, and is rewarded for that uh, computational power. They're then given that reward and some pundits or analysts have uh, speculated that some of that reward typically is sell pressure onto the network as those mining operations typically need to facilitate very large scale operations, very energy intensive operations, which again is something that we're gonna talk about in more detail. And as Will alluded to, um, when it comes to hackers of any particular network, whether it be proof of work or proof of stake, as it relates to proof of work, a hacker would have to have 51% of that network's compute power to be able to quote unquote hack that network or manipulate that blockchain. With the massive amount of compute power that's consumed by the Bitcoin network, that would be almost inconceivable at this point. As Will said, a, a lot of the major blockchains have reached that critical mass where manipulation is very unlikely um, and, it, and it makes this transition really possible for the Ethereum network. So moving on to proof of stake. Um, proof of stake is different than proof of work in that transactions are not validated by a very high power computer that's validating a cryptographic puzzle and then being rewarded a token. Those transactions are being validated by what's called a validator node. And those validator nodes are, are um, uh, a place where you can deposit your token on that network and um, the capacity of that network depends on the amount of stake that's put into those validator nodes. And those validator nodes will come to something called a consensus on a particular transaction. So if the blockchain introduces a potential transaction, those validator nodes will come to a consensus, approve the transaction, and then the transaction's mined. If one of those validator nodes brings data that's incorrect to that transaction, it depends on the network's parameters, but there will be some type of adjudication process where that uh, validator node could be slashed and could lose their stake. So again, staking is a process in which you become a stakeholder in the network, you provide your token or your asset essentially as collateral into that validator node that then processes or validates those transactions as they're introduced to the blockchain and you are participating in the network. So you are then provided a fee and you can collect rewards from that network and you're given essentially what uh, amounts to a staking yield. For anyone that's, inter or that's familiar with the beacon chain that launched uh, on Ethereum last year, that provided the opportunity for people to stake into the Ethereum 2.0 network and start receiving what is currently roughly a 4% yield um, in anticipation for this transition from proof of work to proof of stake. And then again, to Will's point, um, the network has really reached that critical mass where it is would be extremely, extremely, extremely challenging for a ha hacker um, to own 51% of the cryptocurrency on a network the size and scale of Ethereum. Whereas if you have a proof of stake network, that's a tiny network, that's just a fledgling project that's getting started, that attack becomes very, very much a risk vector for that project. Whereas 
Ethereum has really reached a critical mass of, of statelessness uh, that no other uh, what will be proof of network uh, comparables um, can really compare themselves to. So again, this transition will be the official transition from this proof of work on the left to the proof of stake uh, on the right. And we can kind of see here with like a nice oversimplification of a visual, um, what this transition looks like. So you'll notice below on the uh, beacon chain where the green line goes below the red, you can see that the beacon chain has also exist, existed, excuse me, simultaneously with the proof of net the proof of work network in the past. So the beacon chain actually went live, excuse me, on December of 2020. So it's existed for some time. And the beacon chain is really a ledger of accounts that conducts and coordinates the network of stakers. So it isn't quite like the Ethereum mainnet that is currently running today. It does not currently process or handle transactions it's really a new consensus mechanism or engine that's going to soon take place for what is currently the proof of work mining algorithm, which is gonna bring all the significant improvements that Will alluded to at the beginning of the presentation. So the Beacon Chain's role will actually change over time. As of now, um, it's really seen as, as kind of a lighthouse that's guiding us from proof of work to proof of stake. But it's also going to be a foundational component of sharding and directing validators as Ethereum's network expands, um, which it expands exponentially into the future, not linearly. Um, Kyle, that's also so important. Uh, and, the, and the fact that these have been operating in parallel is important is because we take uh, less risk that someone's not going to just press a button, try to upload some code and hope it works. This has been working in parallel. It's been operational. It's been tested and it's been working well, which brings us great confidence that when it's ultimately merged, it should be a seamless merge. Yep. Thank you, Will. So a question that commonly comes up and a little bit of humor here, but what happens to what happens to miners um, in this, this transition? And you know, unfortunately, for miners that may have invested significant amount of of of, of capital uh, intensive uh, resources into mining equipment and and ASIC miners and so forth, they're going to have to transition. They're going to either have to repurpose that equipment for another network or change their business model in some way, shape, or form. But this has been a clear part of the Ethereum roadmap for many years, so it shouldn't be any surprise. Um, to any uh, stakeholders in the network, uh, because this is something that's been really anticipated for many years at this point. And it's a bit of decentralization to that too, Kyle, that I love in that for about $32,000 of cost, yep. you can become a validator in this new post-merge Ethereum. Whereas previously there was you know, a bit of centralization around who, the, who we were depending on for mining based on who could afford to build these big rigs and put all this cap capital into the market. And now it's further decentralizing those that can operate nodes, which is healthy for the network. Absolutely, it lowers the barrier to entry for individuals that wanna participate in the network, that want to participate in that consensus process and, and, and validation of the network. So this was an image that jumped out that we really liked and I think is an apt analogy or comparison for the Beacon Chain's role, not only it, at this point of the merge, but uh, more broadly into the other steps of development of the, the Ethereum network. It really is the lighthouse that guides us through this transition. Um, when you deposit Ethereum into Lido currently or Rocket Pool, you're really de depositing your Ethereum into a beacon chain node um, that is currently existing in parallel with Ethereum's uh, consensus layer. But very soon, once the transition takes place to proof of work, will be um, the main uh, layer of, of consensus for the Ethereum network. So one thing we wanted to do is just touch on some of the misconceptions around the merge, because I think it's, it's, it's appropriate to try to set some, some expectations uh, around what this process will look like. So the merge immediately is, not, is projected to not reduce transaction fees significantly. So this is just a visual of the beacon chain and the uh, EVM proof of work chain um, uh, existing in parallel and then again merging 
quite a literal definition into the um, ex executable beacon chain EVM um, after the merge is complete. But um, the, the, the concept that the fees will be reduced significantly really is going to take place once sharding is implemented. And sharding is something that we're gonna to touch on here shortly, but which is anticipated to be uh, in next year, 2023. But unfortunately, block space for Ethereum will probably exist at a premium relative to other layer one chains for the rest of this year and probably into next year as we get to the sharding of the development roadmap. So just one thing to uh, level set expectations is we don't project there to be a significant reduction of fees in the near term. But one other misconception that I think is appropriate to mention is it's, it's commonly misunderstood in my opinion, how much the energy consumption of the network really will be reduced. I think it's consensus at this point that the energy consumption will be reduced, but how much it will be reduced, I think is a misconception. So if on this image here, we could see the Bitcoin network in terms of energy consumption being as tall as the Burj Khalifa. So a massively tall um, building, tallest building in the world. And then if you compare that to Ethereum's proof of network today, you have the leaning tower of Pisa. If you extrapolate it to the Ethereum network, once we transition to proof of stake, you literally have a screw on the ground. So you see a massive, massive reduction to in terms of the uh, energy uh, consumption of the network. And energy consumption has actually been prohibitive for many large institutions that are looking at Ethereum as an asset class or as digital assets more broadly as an asset class. You know, with ESG concerns and so forth, this has been something that has prevented a lot of these larger entities from taking a closer look. So just one thing that we're very excited about in that transition is the massive reduction in, uh, in energy consumption when it comes to validating a transaction because that energy consumption won't be taking place at the miner level. It will really be uh, just validator nodes validating transactions through software and through individuals staking their Ethereum onto those nodes and those nodes coming to that level of consensus uh, to validate transactions and blocks. So very quickly, just talking about what's coming up next um, in terms of sharding. And again, this is something that we see coming in 2023 and are extremely excited about. Um, sharding suggests, as we can see here in the title, uh, that nodes store only some data and rely on each other to get more information. So Vitalik says that the Ethereum network, um, and this was from his quote uh, in the Th Ethereum's conference in Paris, that the surge, the upcoming surge will boost the network scalability massively. So according to Vitalik, when ETH uh, goes through the surge next year, the network will be able to process 100,000 transactions per second. So he commented that after the merge, he sees the network as 55% complete and that one of the most important steps will be going through this sharding um, process through the surge, which gets the network to over again, he projects 100,000 transactions per second. And more specifically, as you can see over on the right, you know, what is sharding? Sharding really is the process of splitting a database horizontally and spreading the load, uh, the compute load across those networks horizontally. It's a, it's a common concept in computer science. Um, and in, in Ethereum's context, it'll work synergistically with all of the layer twos like Optimism and like Arbitrum by splitting the specific burden um, that these networks have in handling the transactions and the congestion. And a lot of people that were using Ethereum last year when we saw peak uh, capacity, let's say, on mainnet prior to the deployment of the layer twos at scale, this sharding will be able to reduce the congestion and get us to a point where, again, 100,000 transactions per second is not only feasible, but is uh, expected uh, in terms of capacity on the network, which will be a, a, a very exciting development. And I think position Ethereum to become the, the decentralized compute layer um, for this digital assets ecosystem and for this smart contract ecosystem, whether it's NFTs, whether it is decentralized finance, it really will be the compute engine in, in my eyes. Uh, for a lot of these, these decentralized applications to exist and to thrive and to service their customers with products and services that they love in a decentralized way.
So a good way that we talk about that sometimes is uh, in the visualization that's been helpful for me to, to use with investors from all walks of life is uh, picture I want to tell Kyle what my phone number is. And for him to validate what my phone number is, he has to get all 10 digits correct. So the computing power of validating my phone number is checking 10 consecutive or contiguous digits. By sharding, or what we sometimes talk about as a thesis in our fund, uh, zero knowledge proofs, which we're excited about as well, you can bifurcate or, or, or dissect those 10 digits into 10 independent single transactions or single validations. So think about how much easier it is for me on a iPhone to validate whether or not the first number in my cell phone number is a six, right? I can easily validate that. It's easy to test. The computing power to validate it is de minimis. When I then have to go fill, uh, solve a 26 digit problem, now I need a mining rig. Now I need significant power. Now I need significant energy. So you can see where this next phase of the maturation will, will um, shard the burden more decentrally and allow for us to move faster. Yeah, there's discussion also of it reducing the requirement uh, for the amount of Ethereum that you would have to stake in nodes and reduce the compute power required to stake um, uh, in that you would be able to do it on a simple old laptop and just continue to decentralize the network further and further and reduce those barriers to entry. For anyone who's followed the Ethereum network, they know that uh, Vitalik and the developing development ecosystem has oh, have always prioritized decentralization over um, you know, speed in the short term. Um, when it comes to the trilemma that people con constantly refer to when discussing um, blockchain development and uh, innovation. So moving on, uh, ultrasound money was uh, as a narrative that's commonly referred to in the Ethereum ecosystem. And Will, uh, I think, did a great job of describing some of those concepts at the beginning of the presentation. But I think this visual is, is extremely powerful in describing just generally what this concept is. So this idea of ultrasound money really came from, as Will said, um, EIP-1559, which went live in August last year. And as of the spring of this year, burned over 2 million Ethereum. That number obviously has grown uh, considerably. But as it relates to EIP-1559, it's debatably, and I think in my opinion, it is the most significant update uh, to the Ethereum network and the Ethereum ecosystem. So the proposal itself, when approved and implemented, overhauled Ethereum's fee dynamics, as we've already alluded to. With uh, this EIP, we've seen the base fee um, set, which is set automatically by the Ethereum protocol, um, automatically burned instead of being given back to miners as rewards. So if you think about that, as of prior to EIP-1559, those fees were all given to miners. Those miners have significant um, costs associated with their operations. They're also receiving the block reward. In most cases, those miners were adding sell pressure to the market, um, especially in adverse market conditions. Once EIP-1559 was implemented, that base fee was again set aside and burned. So as more transactions on the network were executed and congestion on the network increased and there was more activity on the network, more Ethereum was burned and more Ethereum was burned. And that creates a reflexive mechanism where um, more Ethereum is burned as there's more activity. Um, you can see also that in this, uh, as of today, in this image, we still have the miner involved in every single transaction. Once we transition from proof of work to proof of stake, that this dynamic changes. The tip is, tip is no longer uh, provided to the miner. The block reward is no longer provided to the miner. You still receive a fee as a staker into the Ethereum network if you're providing your Ethereum into a validator node, but significantly more Ethereum is going to be set aside and burned. And this EIP-1559 becomes more deflationary over time as more and more usage of the Ethereum network continues to grow. So it really reinforces the dynamic that Will mentioned at the beginning of this call, that this is an asset class that's going through a very important technological transition, 
we've went live on many of the test nets, including Robston and uh, many of the others. And this is a critical inflection point where something that's been talked about for years now in terms of this transition will go live. And even though there are some misconceptions about what it could look like in the next 30 to 60 days, it is a foundational technological advancement that will continue to be built on over time as we not only complete the merge, but then we move on to sharding. And I think that this, these developments build on themselves exponentially over time and is a real testament to the Ethereum developer community that again is decentralized and completely uh, spread all over the world and working on this project simultaneously. Um, and again, not sacrificing um, uh, decentralization for any other uh, short-term rewards um, that, that other layer one blockchains may have positioned themselves for. And Kyle, so, I read at one point, this might not be accurate, but uh, I'll, I'll test it, that the, the merge succeeding decentrally is the equivalent of Microsoft saying, I'm going to take every single one of the developers that I have and, sp and have them do nothing but focus on this one. That's the amount of lift and that's the amount of decentral support that this merge ha has had. I agree. I think there's many people on this call that have built and shipped softwares and technologies and, 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 and understand the, the ambitious nature of this project and the fact that it happened completely decentralized with developers all over the world is a massive, massive testament to not only Ethereum, but I think digital assets more broadly. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Will, Wes, Liam, Shannon. No, that was great, buddy. Thank you. Um, you did a great job of uh, of keeping it a decent high level, but also getting technical, uh, which you always do. And, and you also accomplished your goal of not either purging or splurging during the call. <laughs> Thank Good you. Job. Um, we've answered a few questions in the chat um, and we're happy to continue to do that to do so. Uh, if not, you know, there's a lot of familiar faces here. Uh, we're thankful for the support. I'm, I'm super impressed and, and, and glad with how many people have, have dialed into this. This is clearly a very relevant topic in the markets today. And, um, and hopefully we gave you a little bit of an insight into it and into how we're playing it and um, um, to where we're seeing consolidation occur. Um, so I, I don't think that there's anything that's been left unsaid. You did a great job. Thank you. <clears throat> Doesn't seem to be any more questions. So I guess we can end it here and, and try to keep it to about 30 minutes and, uh, and, uh, happy to be available to, to anyone for more specifics. Uh oh, hold on. There's two questions. Uh, what in your estimation is the probability that some miners incent a parallel proof of work ETH chain, or is it a done deal? I happy to speculate that it's a done deal. It's uh, it's past. It, it's the critical mass is way beyond uh, competition at, at at some point. Uh, at this point, Vitalik publicly stated that if uh, any developers or stakeholders in the network are interested in a proof of work ETH chain, that ETH Classic is always an available option for them. And then there's a question about, uh, in essence, will they this be a sell the news? um uh, type of event uh we are monitoring that and there's potential for that because there is such strong energy leading into this merge succeeding um at the moment that it does succeed many people from our team believe that um eth won uh and it's going to be really hard for eth to have a competitor so i don't know if that creates a sell the news thing since there's no longer competition in the near term for who the core blockchain will be on a go forward. Um, but like any trading activity, you know, we will be very liquid trading into and out of that. It will be the same token post merge as it is uh, current. So if you just go on any wallet and buy Ethereum uh, in, in any manner, you know, not Ethereum classic, Ethereum, uh, just buy the one with the biggest market cap, um, about $1,740 last I checked, uh, you will have the asset that we're referring to in your wallet. Cool. Well, we better stop before I get one. There's, I don't know. The there's answer. one more, guys. Sorry. If you want to just address that last one. I think we did. Okay. The token. Yep. Yep.
Great. Well, thanks for dialing in and supporting us in all the ways that you do. And uh, feel free to reach out directly. And we're happy to have offline com communications uh, with anyone. Thank you.